Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Enabling Large-Scale Multidisciplinary Design Optimization with the Cloud. And we'll be exploring some of the cutting-edge work in MDO by the University of Michigan's Aerospace Department, and we'll see an MDO airfoil analysis that leverages AdFlow and the AdFlow CFD solver and a machine learning based surrogate aerodynamic model trained and deployed on the Rescale platform. Whew, that's a mouthful. Uh, my name is Jolie Hales. I'm with Rescale and I will be your moderator today. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Our first presenter for today is Keen Martins, who is a professor at the University of Michigan, where he heads the Multidisciplinary Design Optimization Laboratory at the Department of Aerospace Engineering. His research involved the development and application of MDO methodologies to the design of aircraft configurations, with a focus on high fidelity simulations that take advantage of high performance parallel computing. He has served as associate editor for the AIAA Journal, as well as the engineering journal Optimization and Engineering. He is currently an associate editor for the Journal of Aircraft and Structural and Multidisciplinary Optimization. And then after Joaquin, we'll hear from Eric Muir, who is a solutions architect at Rescale. A little bit about Eric, uh, he has a decade of both academia and industry experience in structural dynamics, aerodynamics, and aeroelasticity, and has recently focused on machine learning applications in computer-aided engineering and autonomous vehicles development. He is enthusiastic about Rescale's vision to enable engineering and scientific simulation in the cloud and help accelerate the next generation of technological breakthroughs. And prior to joining Rescale, Eric Muir earned his bachelor's, master's, and his PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and worked at the Boeing Company in Seattle, Washington. So we have a couple awesome people with fantastic resumes here to talk to you today. And at this time, I will go ahead and turn webinar control over to you, Keen, from the University of Michigan. In just a moment, you should see controls pop up. There All we right. are. All right. Take it away, Keen. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Jolie. Um, and just before I start, I actually want to just say a few words about my um, how I found out about Rescale. And this was uh, one of my former students, Peter Liu, who was, I mentioned here at the bottom, who um, after graduating uh, went to work for Rescale. And um, he was very nice to come by a couple of times after he graduated to pay me a visit. And he first told me about Rescale. And I'm a cloud skeptic. And so when he told me about this, I thought, well, I don't know about that. I'm not sure this is going to be that useful. Well, actually, uh, this past year, I ended up using Rescale a lot. And it was indispensable for uh, the work I was doing. And you'll see some more about that towards the end of the presentation. So thank you, Peter, for introducing me to that. Um, so just a quick overview on uh, the MDO lab. Uh, see our research in two. Uh, main thrusts. One is uh, the development of fundamental uh, algorithms for MDO that can be applied to anything. Uh, but I also like applications because that really um, tests the algorithms that we develop in practice. And I'm particularly passionate about applications to aircraft design there. However, a lot of these applications um, are also uh, in other areas such as car aerodynamics, wind turbine design, hydrofoil design, battery satellites, um, and other applications as well, in collaborations with other um, investigators. So it's no secret that numerical methods have been playing an increasing role in engineering simulations and replacing a lot of the experiments. Uh, for example, if you look at the Airbus A380 and the Airbus A350, um, we see 40% fewer wind tunnel days. So we haven't replaced experiments completely, but we're on the way there. So a numerical simulation is great because you can uh, set up the parameters, geometry, uh, like wingspan, for example, for shapes, the structural sizing and so on. And you can run a simulation to find out the performance of a given system, in this case, an airplane, for fuel burns, structural tresses, and so on. So now it's great to have a fast simulation, and if it runs on HPC using Rescale, some other resources, uh, great. And the faster it runs, the better. 
However, you got to think about what you're going to do with this simulation result, right? And typically that means some sort of design changes because the chances are your first guess at the design is not the best. Uh, but these design changes can be very tedious if you do them by hand and if you have hundreds or thousands of parameters to change and you end up with no intuition about how to improve the design. And this is where numerical optimization comes in. You basically do these design changes automatically based on this optimization problem. So if you set up a problem where you minimize a function, the objective, with respect to a set of design variables subject to some constraints, and you set up numerical optimization to do this, it can do that loop completely automatically and find not just a better result, but a provably best design. That's the promise. In practice, um, it's not a push button solution unless you have a relatively simple problem. In practice, you end up doing a series of optimization problems to explore the design space, and you're going to have to reformulate this optimization problem and also do post-optimality studies because you cannot go um, to your manager and say, look, I got this optimum that uh, optimization found, and that's the optimum. You need to be able to explain the trade-offs and the physics of that optimum. Otherwise, the specialists will not uh, believe you. So when it comes to optimization, there are two main classes of uh, optimization algorithms. The ones above there in orange and blue are gradient-free methods. The ones at the bottom are gradient-based methods. The key here is that the gradient-free methods do not scale well with the number of dimensions, the number of design variables that you're going to change. Uh, and therefore, for a large number of design variables, which is the, usually the case for us, if you want to parameterize the sizing of the structure, aerodynamic shape, and so on, you're talking about hundreds of variables at least. And for those, the only hope is to use gradient-based algorithms. Furthermore, uh, if you're going to, using a gradient-based algorithm, you need to compute these gradients with respect to these hundreds or thousands of variables. And to do that efficiently, you need analytic methods. And that's what shows there at the bottom, the two lines at the bottom in green and purple, they show that if you compute your gradient efficiently and use a gradient-based optimization, then you can handle such large problems. And this is why in our group, we have dedicated a lot of the, the research and development into computing gradients to use with gradient-based optimization. When you look at OMDO, we can look at two axes. One is the number of disciplines. The other one is fidelity on those disciplines. What we're trying to do is go in a diagonal here and do high fidelity in two or more disciplines. And this is what I'm going to show you later on today. Uh, for now, I'm going to focus on doing aerodynamic shape optimization with high fidelity uh, by solving the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. And for this, we created this open source framework called Mac Aero, and it consists of an optimizer, a geometry primitization, the volume deformation, CFD solver, and adjoint solver. The adjoint solver is the module that computes these gradients efficiently that I was emphasizing before. All these are independent modules that can be used separately, uh, and they work together in this framework. And they are modules that can be replaced by other methods as well. So it's a modular approach to uh, aerodynamic shape optimization. So let's first talk about the CFD solvers. We can use it, either use AD Flow or OpenFoam. OpenFoam is another open source solver. AD Flow is our in-house uh, CFD solver. Uh, and this is a very robust solver. Uh, it runs in parallel, uses a new approximate newton krylov method uh, that is both fast and robust. And this robustness is, is really important because when we do optimization, you are going to see situations that you wouldn't normally choose for the CFD solver to solve. Um, as an example here, this is a Boeing 777 type airplane flying at 80 5% distributed sound at an uh, angle of attack of 90 degrees, okay? So this will never happen in reality. But as I'll show you in a second, the optimizer could call for such a crazy solution, okay? And it you have to be able to solve it with the CFT solver. Otherwise, it interrupts the whole optimization cycle and is a big waste of time. So as an example here of the aerodynamic optimization, um, this is a optimization where we're minimizing the drag of a shape starting from a circle at 73% of the speed of sound. So we're well into the transonic regime where we have shocks there shown in yellow, a lot of separation in the back. 
This starting shape is not very good at all, a lot of drag, and it's difficult to solve. So again, that's why we need a robust solver. And if we let optimization run, it eventually finds an airfoil with uh, that's round in the front, sharp in the back. And um, those of you who um, have an aero background will recognize this as a super critical airfoil. This took NASA a decade uh, to develop. And here we independently discovered it a couple of decades late, but um, the result really makes sense uh, if you know about aerodynamic shape optimization. Uh, now, what happens in, in this aerodynamic shape optimization is that you end up with intermediate results that are kind of crazy. No good designer would come up with this shape and ask the CFD to solve it. However, the optimizer doesn't have that intuition, is searching around the design space. Sometimes it has some crazy ideas. Uh, but again, it's important for the solver to be able to solve this. And our solver does that and is able to progress with optimization until it converges to the actual shape. Um, we can also use open foam in this framework. I won't go into that. Um, to do CFD, you need a mesh. And for this, we have PyHip. Uh, this mesh generator is also open source. And this uses a hyperbolic mesh generation algorithm. We can do overset meshes as shown here. Uh, to create meshes of complex configurations such as this one. Um, on the geometry parameterization, there's a couple of different engines we can use. Um, just going to show you some um, our geometry engine called PyGeo. It uses a freeform deformation, and here we're showing uh, that approach applied to the wing, where you can change the twist. We can change the um, other variables such as the uh, tail rotation individual points in the aerodynamic shape for uh, controlling the airfoil span and also uh, sweep okay um, now this works together with the volume mesh deformation so the here's showing an airfoil showing pi geo changing the geometry of the airfoil and together with uh, perturbing the mesh the cfd mesh so that we can run the cfd on it and these two work seamlessly uh, as shown here in three dimensions, uh, we're taking a wing here and we're taking that geometry and the mesh and deforming it by taking that wing and unsweeping it to zero degrees, adding some dihedral and bending the tip. And all this is done step by step. And at each step, we have a valid CFT solution. So this shows that we can use this approach to do plan form optimization where we show change the uh, plan form of the wing. Uh, and this is something that hadn't been done um, up to this point. So uh, on the optimizer, um, we use um, SNOPT, uh, which is a uh, state-of-the-art um, optimizer, gradient-based optimizer. And we created our own wrapper for that. Uh, and this wrapper actually can, with this wrapper, we can use other optimizers as well. The idea here is that we develop a wrapper. Again, it's open source. It's written in Python. and we can choose easily between different optimization packages, including SNOPT, which we use, or even a gradient-based optimizer or a gradient-free optimizer in case um, you want to wait um, a bit longer to have your optimization uh, be done. Uh, with this PyOpt Sparse, it all provides OptView, which is a way to uh, check your optimization history and um, debug your optimizations. Okay, I emphasized before the derivative computation, really important to compute derivatives and or gradients um, accurately and efficiently. And uh, there are various methods of doing this. I won't go into the details here, but uh, just to show you here, the analytic methods uh, or implicit analytic methods, uh, such as the adjoint method, are very efficient for this. Um, algorithmic differentiation methods, shown on the right, um, are typically not as efficient, but they are automatic because they basically process your code and create the derivative code automatically. What we have done, our approach has been to combine those two, the analytic approach and the algorithmic differentiation approach in a hybrid approach where we use the both, uh, we get the best of both worlds. We get the accuracy and the, well, both are accurate, but we get the efficiency of the analytic methods and the automatic um, uh, characteristics of the algorithmic differentiation on the right. Uh, and to do this, we separate uh, an adjoint implementation on any code. We generalize this into a solver-agnostic implementation and solver-specific implementation. 
So that uh, basically created a recipe for uh, implementing this Agile method with any code. Uh, typically, the Agile method takes a lot of development effort. Um, with this recipe, that cuts down on development effort. It's still significant, but uh, it cuts, down, cuts it down significantly. So what does this enable us to do? So let's look at some applications. So this is um, an optimization actually part of Peter Liu's thesis. This is a benchmark case um, that we contributed to uh, from the um, aircraft or aerodynamic design optimization discussion group and AIAA group. Uh, and this is uh, one of the more complex groups at the uh, benchmarks at the time. Uh, that is a wing in transonic flow analyzed with the RANs. Um, and where we minimize the drag for a given lift. And you can see here in this video, uh, on the left, you see the initial one, on the right, you see the optimized one. And you can see how the optimization uh, smooths out the pressure distribution. You get nice parallel isobars there, removes the shock, uh, makes the spanwise distribution elliptical, and really minimizes the drag there. We did a lot of studies on this, so uh, we know this case very well by now. And another thing we did, um, so this takes about six hours and 128 cores. I think the time by now is cut in half with uh, the new code and now with new processors, I would say even, even faster than this. Um, now there are two types of problems I like. One is to start with a good design like we did here. This is a good design because uh, NASA designed this wing together with Boeing as a benchmark, not a real airplane, not quite as good as a 777, uh, but close, close enough. Um, and we took that uh, wing designed by an expert and we reduced the drag by 8.5%. Another case I like is to start with garbage, basically. Start with a really bad shape and then have the optimizer um, design the, the wing. So I asked um, Peter, uh, after getting this result, what is the crappiest wing you can start with and still get the same result? And he came up with this. And I thought he was joking, uh, but actually, this did converge. It took a bit longer. So this is a crazy shape it generated by adding random uh, perturbations to the design variables. The initial solution is not uh, physical because you have a lot of separation and so on, but it doesn't matter because the gradients point in the right direction. Once it smooths the airfoil, the physics are correct, and eventually it converges to the same result as we had before. Um, I always had this dream of... Uh, optimizing an airplane where you start from a sphere and that becomes an airplane automatically. We're not quite there yet, but there's this uh, recent work that we did where we start um, with a shape that needs to envelop a human. Um, and if we optimize that, uh, we had to develop some specific uh, packaging constraints to contain the, the human in there. And you can see it uh, produces a very intuitive shape, a teardrop shape there that minimizes the drag subject to containing uh, the human. Um, our codes also enable this web foil. Uh, this is a web app where you can optimize things. It uses machine learning, so you can optimize airfoils within a couple of seconds. And it also contains a, a huge database of all uh, known airfoils, all the airfoil data that we could find. Um, now, aerodynamics is not the end of the story. Uh, we need to have structures because wings are flexible, as you see here. Um, so um, we want to couple a finite element code for structures together with the CFD that I showed you to get the flying shape of the wing, as well as being able to do design trades. For, so design the structural sizing and the shape of the wing simultaneously um, to get the best possible wing. Uh, to do this, we expanded this framework um, to include aerostructural uh, analysis and optimization, and to compute the gradients of this coupled solver that couples the flow solver, the CFD, with the structural solver, we had to develop this coupled adjoint solver. And that's really the key for getting this done. So now we can take that same um, 777 like configuration, optimize it. Um, and for this, we have various design variables here. So we can see the twist, you can see the shape of the airfoil. Um, notice that the shape of the airfoil changes not just the aerodynamic shape but the internal wing box, that's the structure, okay? Uh, and then we have cord, we have span, as well as sweep, and finally the tail rotation as well to trim the airplane. So uh, here's an example of an optimization. Um, it's two optimizations really. 
they both have about 1,000 variables, about 1,000 constraints, um, but the objective is different. On the left, we have a minimization of takeoff gross weight. On the right, we minimize the fuel burn. Otherwise, these two problems are exactly the same. And you can see that you get very different planforms. On the right, the fuel burn tends to favor minimizing drag, so it increases the span to reduce to reduce the induced drag, lift induced drag. On the left, we have a minimization of takeoff gross weight. That ends up with a uh, wing with a smaller span. The wing is lighter, but the airplane burns more fuel as a result because the drag is higher than on the right. And you can see how flexible the wing here, the, the la larger span uh, wing is. All right, so um, we have used this framework, Mark, for um, many other applications. And one of them was run on Rescale. And this was work that we did with uh, Arion to optimize their uh, AS2 configuration. Um, and for the aerodynamic model, we have this uh, RENS overset mesh for the fuselage and wing. Uh, for the structure, we have the structure show there on the left. And the objective here is to maximize a combined range. So we're looking at, uh, it's really important to have adequate performance in the subsonic um, or uh, the uh, transonic regime and uh, good performance or best performance in the supersonic. And you can trade between those two, right? So transonic and supersonic, two different Mach numbers, just below the speed of sound and um, uh, 1.4 times the, the speed of sound. Um, and we did this by um, uh, computing the range using this Breger range equation. All right, so here are some optimizations and you can see we optimize the airfoil shape um, as well as the uh, structural sizing. Um, and it, again, traded between the transonic and supersonic design point. Uh, it redistributed the volume. Volume distribution is really important for uh, supersonic drag. And it did um, some of the things that uh, we would expect. Um, depending on the emphasis for uh, the uh, transonic versus the supersonic, for emphasis on the transonic, uh, the beta equals 0.25. You can see you have a larger span with lower sweep. For more emphasis on supersonic um, performance, we have uh, the shorter span, um, larger sweep, beta equals one. Uh, so all these planforms are obtained with full aerostructural uh, optimizations. So we did a large number of them. And uh, rescale here was really um, a lifesaver because um, we had a deadline, and the week before, we had solved our first successful aerostructural optimization case, so one of the points in this curve. And all the other points in the curve were obtained within a week. Again, thanks to Rescale for being able to run them uh, right away. Um, in an uh, academic setting, I get a lot of uh, computing time for free. It's free, but I need to wait a couple of days in a queue and so on. Uh, with the Rescale resource, this basically ran instantly. And again, that was a lifesaver. And you can see here with aerostructural optimization, it really opens up the design space, enables more freedom, and enables us to find uh, better results. So to sum it up here, um, gradient maze optimization together with efficient, grades, efficient uh, gradient computation is a very powerful combination. Um, the implementation of adjoint methods is hard work, but worth it. And we came up with a recipe to facilitate this. And then we demonstrated all this in large scale, high fidelity aircraft design, including the supersonic business jet configuration uh, that we um, solved with re rescale resources, which was really an invaluable um, resource. Uh, so all these tools that I showed here are now open source, okay? Um, we put an emphasis on um, you know, developing theory and implementing that, we put emphasis on having a good implementation so that we can have large-scale applications that can really show off what we can do. Uh, in my experience, that's how industry buys into things. They need to see that things are um, efficient enough. Uh, we've worked with several uh, partners, industrial partners on this, as you show here there. Um, and because all this is open source software, um, it is now um, ready to be um, open on, on Rescale for those of you who are interested. So go forth and optimize. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, King.
Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Professor Martins, for you know all the great introduction, um, you know, to to all these different topics, and and even you know showcasing um, a lot of the workflows behind. Um, so really excited to to co-present together um, and introduce uh, the Rescale platform, and then and then give some uh, live examples of how um, the Rescale platform. Um, is is able to be leveraged with these MDO open source tools that Professor Martins just um, showed. Just wanted to um, first get started with a quick slide showcasing the uh, the Rescale platform kind of in a nutshell. Um, so the Rescale platform is a cloud-based uh, engineering uh, simulation and analysis platform. And um, since it's cloud-based, it um, pulls together a very easy to use web UI, but more importantly, what it does is it marries over 650 different engineering and scientific applications um, that have been hosted and tuned together with um, the breadth and, and capability of the compute resources that are available today uh, in the cloud. So as you can see from all the logos here, not only do we host um, you know, all of the top um, engineering analyses into the different niche as well as open source, but we combine that together in one easy to use platform um, with the, the various cloud providers such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. And then just taking it one step further, um, we provide a seamless integration of both the web UI with these software and hardware resources so that the experience is seamless and it gives the engineers the um, compute and, and simulation tools they need right at their fingertips so that they can, um, you know, put the gas pedal down to the metal, if you will, uh, as Professor Martins was mentioning, um, to, to go ahead and do the analyses when you need it at the scale you need. Um, as an engineer myself, one thing that I really enjoy and, and, um, and find, you know, exceptional about the Rescale platform is all of the, the additional features that it provides to maximize your productivity, let you explore, innovate, and design even faster. And so, uh, unlike a typical HPC system where you have the software and the compute, um, Rescale provides you flexibility, scalability, reliability. And it does so, like I mentioned, first of all, th through a web UI, which I'll show you a live demonstration of later today. And that is so powerful because I can use that on my computer at work, uh, my local workstation there or at home, I can pull it up on my mobile phone even um, and be able to check and, and do an engineering analyses. But then even going beyond that, when you talk about um, the different hardware options available to do engineering simulations, it's constantly changing. And Rescale provides the latest and greatest to you right in your fingertips, both CPUs as, G as well as GPUs. And then also, you know, the, the memory and the network fabric and everything else that really makes your engineering simulations run optimally. And then finally, um, the Rescale platform has a lot of really convenient um, features that allow you to um, automate your workflows, interact with them in numerous different ways and integrate it into other um, tools. So we have a command line interface as well as a REST API. So all in all, this really is a cloud simulation platform that is um, designed for engineers by engineers. So when we talk in the context of, of MDO and, and simulation, and Professor Martins gave a great introduction, I wanted to just start with, you know, what's kind of a typical design cycle um, that many of us as engineers are used to. And when I worked at Boeing, this was, you know, very typical of, of the iterations we would go through um, to design aircraft. And so, you know, you have lots of different, um, um, you know, knowledge and inputs that you might, and design variables that you might have when you're going through from a paper design um, to reality. And then you have engineering tools as well, simulations um, as well as tests. And ultimately, though, um, this is a fairly linear and serial system where you start with some, some sort of design, you do some analysis, you look at the results of that analysis, and then you iterate. And when you look at this across organizations of hundreds and thousands of engineers, um, you know, this, is, this can be um, several months per iteration to, to go through here. And so when you wanna start you know, designing your 
um, products more optimally. Um, you know, you, you have a desire to explore the design space even further. And so there's a lot of great resources out there for being able to um, do design exploration by essentially running multiple different analyses um, that you've parameterized uh, the inputs over. And so for this particular instance, rather than doing a single uh, analysis of a potential design per design cycle, maybe you look at 10 or 15 or 100. But then when you think about the compute required for that, um, if you want to do them in a time efficient manner, you need 100 times the amount of uh, engineering compute to do the analyses. So this is getting beyond what you can uh, even do, you know, on a, on a local computer. And that's where, you know, the HPC and even the scalability provided by the cloud, you know, really can be leveraged. Um, and, and so the next step then, as Professor Martin's introduced, is then to fully optimize where instead of just exploring the design space, you identify some objective functions and constraints, um, and you let the sophisticated numerical methods do the actual um, design um, adjustments and, and achieving the optimal design for you. And so when you look at even a workflow like this, um, it looks simplistic, and you know there are a lot of great numerical methods to assist, but this represents a large amount of compute uh, you have CFD solvers that you know run over um, hundreds, if not even a thousand different uh, CPU cores. Those have to be combined with, say, structural solvers, um, and then other um, you know geometric patch packages, meshing software. And so, in order to really leverage these types of optimization workflows, you need a platform that not not only can host all the tools, um, but also has the compute resources available. Uh, at the scale you need when you, when you need it. And then finally, um, you need a way to be able to collaborate and establish these workflows conveniently. Um, when you're trying to do these large analyses and design organizations of hundreds of people, um, you know, having kind of thrown together bash scripting and things like that becomes very challenging to scale. So today I wanted to kind of pull the entire dialogue that we've had so far together and um, walk through a couple different um, airfoil optimization tutorials and examples that um, are graciously available from the MDO lab that Professor Martins leads. And I put a screenshot here of that website um, as well as the link. And they're really a great resource if you're new to MDO optimization um, or even if you're not and you wanna just um, you know, really see the power of the tools that they've put together. So today I'm gonna to show you the airfoil optimization tool that is available on their website, but is hosted on a Rescale platform and how do you set that up? And um, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you're interested in replicating these workflows. Um, we do have um, the, all of the mock tools from the MDO lab hosted and configured on Rescale so um, you, know, you can get up to speed and, and get them running uh, efficiently. So just at a very high level, and of course, Professor Martins went into a little more detail here, you know, this is the airfoil optimization uh, with the AdFlow CFD solver that we're going to be looking at, and it has a lot of different components. Um, it has, um, you know, a CFD measure, the AdFlow CFD solver, um, the Pi uh, sparse optimizer, as well as the um, the geometric deformation component. And so, um, all of these different tools um, and more available from the MDO lab are hosted on the Rescale platform. So just uh, before we jump over to show you that environment and how you set that up, um, just wanted to show you how quickly that diagram um, that I showed you and how easily um, it really is set up on our web UI. So this is just a summary of exactly what you saw um, performing that airfoil optimization. All right, let's jump over to uh, the Rescale platform. So uh, we are a web-based platform, as I said. We do have other tools for interacting with our compute um, orchestration and resources, but the main way you'll interact is to go to rescale.com and either uh, sign up if you don't have an account or you can log in. And your first time through, um, it's going to take you to this landing page um, where it'll give you a lot of details. Um, this platform is heavily documented. Um, I know that's always a, a, a challenge I've found whenever you're using, you know, new tools and things of that nature, it's, it's hard to get up to speed. Um, 
but this does a great job of showing you all those features. So the, to create a job on Rescale, uh, it's really as simple as um, walking through a couple steps on the, um, on the web UI here. So as you can see, it walks you through just uh, five different steps before you can then um, submit the job and be on your way. First thing is to um, upload your input files. Oftentimes this is coming from your local computer, um, but we do also have integrations uh, with other uh, cloud storage devices. So for this particular example, there's just a few input files. And those are gonna be uh, uploaded um, and encrypted both in the transit as well as in REST. So security is certainly the bedrock of um, the platform here. Once the inputs are in place, the next thing we wanna do is select the software that we wanna put on our uh, compute cluster to run this job. So as I mentioned, we have over 600 um, different software available and um, there's a full list on our, our website that you can look through. Um, so if you're doing optimization, um, you know, you, you have a breadth of tools that you can integrate with. For this case, um, we have the MDO Labs tools available. And when you bring that software tile in, um, a couple things to note. First of all, you know, we often host different versions of software. So if you have a particular version in mind, you can select that. Um, we also pre-populate um, with the, um, the command that you need to execute a particular run. So here you can see all I need to do is um, add the run file, the Python run file that I want to um, execute. And that's gonna be this airfoil optimization.py. And then the last step would be, uh, oops, sorry, would be setting up the, um, the hardware that you want to um, run your analysis with. So we have over um, 50 different core types available um, and they all vary um, in terms of the processor that they have, uh, the amount of RAM, the interconnect speeds and all these kinds of things. Um, and so we kind of sort them by uh, different general characteristics to help you um, get started. If you're doing a CFD analysis, oftentimes the high interconnect is, is a useful um, core types to start with. For this example, I'm just gonna use um, a general purpose core type because this is a pretty simplistic um, model that we're going to run. And that is basically it. Um, to get started, you then just hit submit. And the job will then um, start provisioning the resources from the cloud and then launch the job in a matter of minutes. I'll show you a running job here in just a moment, but I wanted to point out, um, we make collaboration and um, just ease of use um, number one. And so if you wanted to make um, some minor changes to this same job setup, you have the ability to clone it. Um, you also can share it with a colleague um, or a collaborator using this, uh, this share link here. And then finally, you have the ability to, um, to visualize the results as well as monitor the analysis while it's in process. So I'll show you a few more of those features um, as we go here. So once your job gets launched, it goes into your job lists and you get an active status. So here we see um, that the job is uh, currently running. I actually started this one slightly before today's webinar. If you um, go, see here, if you go and look at that, you can always review the, the setup. So that's what I have here. But you can also go and look at the status. So this job is still running. It's been running for a little over an hour. And we have, quite a few features that make it very convenient to interact with and monitor the jobs. We have this live, fail, uh, live tailing feature that allows you to uh, look at the output from the solver in real time. Um, you can also download any intermediary results if you wanna look at them uh, locally. We also have the ability um, to open an SSH tunnel. Uh, so maybe you wanna make some changes to a file. Um, or you know, maybe put in a, a flag to save a, um, an intermediary result, you have the ability to do that all within the web browser. And then finally, you can visualize the results while the job is running, um, as well as after the job is running. And to do that, we have um, these uh, virtualized desktops, which give you a, um, an environment, whether it's Windows or Linux, that has post-processing tools, 
that you can um, you know monitor and review your your um, analysis uh, while it's running or afterwards. So in this particular case, I'm going to use TechPlot to look at the airfoil shapes as it goes through the optimization. And so um, you just set that up here. You attach the job that you're interested in viewing, and then you can, oops, my connection timed out. So you just connect to it using nice DCV, and it opens up in your browser here. Just wait a moment for it to pull up. So here I have TechPlot already open. Um, this was the initial airfoil that that analysis started from. It's a NACA 0012 airfoil. You can go and load um, further results. So just pick some intermediary uh, result here. Oops, I think I selected the wrong data file. And you can see some kind of intermediary result. As Professor Martins mentioned, um, you don't always get logical results. But when you finally look at uh, one of the later results, you will see that the optimizer has indeed um, converged on uh, what you would expect for uh, minimizing drag. So that's basically the, the process to run an airfoil optimization on Rescale. Hopefully that illustrates how straightforward it is and some of the key features to make the uh, engineering um, behavior on Rescale convenient. Um, I also wanted to, a little bit out of, maybe out of order here, but I also wanted to show another case that's um, inspired by a paper um, from the MDO lab. And this has um, really been a common theme over the last uh, decade or so where instead of running these um, very computationally expensive physical solvers like CFD and finite elements, um, you know, being able to create offline some kind of surrogate model. Here I have a neural net shown, but it could be any number of, of different approaches and basically um, represent the physics, um, albeit at perhaps a, a lower um, fidelity, but um, in a manner that can be um, used with an optimizer and run much more efficiently. And so I'll show you how um, on the Rescale platform, we also have the tools and the frameworks to generate the data to train such a model and then actually do the machine learning training on the platform. And, and this is, as I mentioned, motivated by a paper from um, the MDO lab and uh, cited here, welcome you to read it. It's an interesting read. So basically the steps uh, of the process I'm gonna show you um, is basically using our um, design of experiments framework to create the data generation and then following that we will go through the process of training a machine learning model um, with that data. So what I did in this example is I parameterized a NACA airfoil using um, the the four series uh, number to define the camber maximum thickness um, and so you can also then parameterize your CFD run with angle of attack and Mach number. So I've set that up um, in this case, I'm using the, the uh, SU2 uh, open source CFD solver, but of course, AdFlow, OpenFoam, any of the other CFD solvers would be um, available and, and um, plug and play in this analysis. And then what I'm looking to output is the uh, coefficient of lift and drag as well as their derivatives. And so that I can create a uh, machine learning representation of the, of the relationship between the airfoil shape, the flow, uh, incoming flow characteristics, as well as those lift and drag coefficients. So let's go quickly look at that on Rescale. So I've already got this set up, so I'll just pull it up here. Um, the first step is how do we do the data generation? And so in this one, we use the um, design of experiments framework on Rescale. And what that allows you to do is to take a single set of input files and um, create a template from them and then um, define all of the design parameters that you want to perform a single analysis workflow over, and it will put those design variables in place and run the analysis n number of times and manage all of the orchestration for you. So I'll step you through that process pretty um, easily here, and you'll see what I mean. 
So in this case, I have a template um, file, which basically contains the CFD mesh for a NACA 0012 airfoil. I have a Python script that um, for a new four series airfoil definition will morph that mesh. And then I finally have the SU2 CFD solver input file um, to run the CFD analysis. So the next step is to um, define all of the different parameters that I want to um, explore. And so we have two options, one called a cross product and the other called a Monte Carlo. Essentially, you can either um, run through a grid, if you will, in two dimensions of um, all of the different design points, or you can do a statistical distribution with a Monte Carlo representation. So for this particular example, I have angle of attack um, going from minus five to six, Mach number in the subsonic range, and then these other parameters make up your uh, 0012 airfoil. So it's um, so those those are how I'm defining the shape of the airfoil that I want to create. And then how do you get those parameters into your analysis? Um, and I do I've done that through um, just a very simple bash script where all I'm doing is is I'm passing those variables um, um, into um, a Python script. So this is a very simple setup. But you could also have a CFD definition file here where maybe all you're doing is changing angle of attack and Mach number. And so you would put in your CFD definition file variables, placeholders for angle of attack and Mach number. And for each um, data point in your design of experiments, it would run the CFD analysis, plugging those angle of attack and Mach numbers in for their placeholders. And then finally, um, just actually running, setting up a single run using those Mach number, NACA um, airfoil definition and um, angle of attack. And it's a little bit um, complex here, but you know we're engineers, so we like to you know tweak things so they're perfect. And so I just kind of um, did some things here to make kind of a nice example. So once, oh, I should finally mention on the hardware side. Um, you're able to specify the number of slots, which is essentially how many jobs you want to run in parallel, and then how many um, cores you want to run per job. So in this example, I'm running 10 jobs, and I want to run each job on two uh, resources, or two cores, and I have 500 total jobs to go through. So I'm going to run 10 jobs at a time, um, and then go through it 50 times to get all those jobs done. So um, that'll all run, it, and this example only took about a half hour. These are short CFD runs. But Rescale does a really nice job of tabulating the results for you so that you can interact with each individual run, as well as making it convenient to just download essentially the training data. So here I have a tabulation of all the 500 runs, tells you information about when it started and stopped, but also the angle of attack, uh, Mach number, NACA um, airfoil coefficients, and then the outputs I was interested in, the uh, coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag, um, and the uh, pitching moment, uh, coefficient of pitching moment. And so if you were to just go in to look at any um, one of these runs, you can then see all the files associated with it. And so um, my mesh, particular to this airfoil, which was an 8826 airfoil, which I have no idea what that really looks like, um, is here. Um, I also plotted a, a PNG of the airfoil. So that's what a NACA 8826 airfoil looks like. And then, of course, the output from the CFD run and everything else is self-contained in here. So when you're all set and um, done and you want to use this data for training, you can download the job um, in its entirety, and that's going to um, create a zip file of all those files, or you can also download a CSV. And so the last step then is the actual training of the um, of the uh, rescale. So let's see here, it's my other job that's running uh, res uh, of the machine learning job. So I'll go ahead and um, show you how that looks. So here's an example, and this is again motivated by that part uh, paper from the MDO lab. Um, but here in this case, um, I have my training data in as just they're essentially text files or tabulated data files. Um, and then I have my Python function um, that does the actual training with uh, TensorFlow. And um, so all I've done is just created a 
um, a small rescale job here with TensorFlow installed uh, with GPU and a simple command Python to run it. And in this case, uh, you know, you wouldn't do machine learning training without a GPU. So here I have a GPU core type with an NVIDIA V100 um, GPU, and I'm running it with a single GPU. Of course, you know, depending on the size of the model you're training, you could increase that. So um, those are some different things that you can uh, do all on the platform here, and then finally run the optimization with the machine learning. And um, just to show you, and this is a screenshot from the paper, um, but I thought the results were really interesting. Um, but uh, you know, for this, the examples looked here uh, for the subsonic case, for example, if you look at um, the drag counts that were, um, you know, create your basically the the final drag counts for um, both the optimized airfoil from AdFlow as well as the um, the neural network, um, you know, the results were very similar. And I encourage you to read the paper to learn more about it. Um, but that's how you would run this on Rescale. And so with that, um, I think we'll pass it back to Jolie and thanks everyone for your, your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Eric, appreciate that. Uh, it looks like we did have a few questions come in and just a reminder as we're going through these, if you're out there and you have a question for either Eric or Keem, uh, feel free to type that in the question box and we will try to get to all of them. Um, let's see here, we'll start with Harice. He's got a couple questions here. First is, when performing aero structural optimization, are you considering static aero elasticity? And does each design iteration achieve aero elastic equilibrium? So I don't know. Is that you, Eric, or is that you, Keem? <laughs> Anyone want to take a shot? I think specific to the work that that uh, that Keem, you know, uh, described, he probably should answer. Okay, Keem, I'm trying to get your us. microphone working. Go ahead and hit the little microphone icon. Sometimes it takes. There it is. Okay, Woo! I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, short answer is yes. <laughs> so uh, teach, <laughs> I teach uh, optimization iteration. Um, we have uh, static equilibrium, and we have the wing shape for that flight condition. Great, and there's a follow-up there, kind of along the same lines. When performing structural optimization, you are considering sizing only or optimizing the composite layups too? Uh, so in the case I showed, that's uh, the sizing only, but uh, we have done the composite, well, We've done composite layups in the past, uh, but most of the work we did with composites is actually using um, uh, basically uh, a one variable to direct the whole thing and not doing individual layers. Um, but we've done some work. The most recent one was on uh, toe steering. So using uh, automatic fire replacement machines, you can have this um, curved composite fiber. So we optimized that curve. But what we did was optimize one angle at any given location, and then all the other layers go with that. Um, because optimizing all the layers uh, becomes, uh, it's manageable, but uh, it's pretty challenging. Great, thank you. Here's another question. This one is from Garish. Sorry if I say your name wrong. Uh, did you use one of the SU2 tutorial files for optimization? If yes, would you be able to share which one you used? Yeah, I think this this question is for me. So um, if you're referring to the, the tutorials that we have listed on, um, on our, our documentation, I, that's where I started from. Um, in fact, I, I started with the, the NACA 0012 airfoil tutorial um, as the as kind of the the basis for doing the machine learning um, data uh, the training training data generation, um, and so um, I guess I could uh, you know maybe we can reach out to the participants with that particular link. But otherwise, certainly if you go to rescale.com and under documentation, um, there is an SU2 tutorial um, there, both for optimization as well as I think an angle of attack and Mach number sweep, and it shows you how to use the, the design of experiments um, 
um, framework for that as well. But Eric, uh, if I uh, got it correctly, you didn't do the optimization. You did the machine learning with SU2, right? You... Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, uh, thanks for the clarification. The the optimization that I, that I did, um, and I ran out of time to show the actual framework. But basically, I I reproduced the results that uh, were sh were shown in at the last slide there from the paper, and I used the um, the the code base that's um, referenced in the paper uh, that the MDO lab makes available. So I just demonstrated uh, the step of how to create training data and train a model with it, but the optimization, I used the models um, from the paper. Uh, by the way, I just want to add that uh, we have a, a airfoil tutorial ready for Rescale to put in, uh, in there. Um, just a warning to Rescale, it's uh, really fast, so you're not gonna make a lot of money out of it. But <laughs> many people can uh, run a lot of optimizations to compensate for that. Yeah, that's great. And you know, that's a that's a great thing with, with Rescale too, is you know, if you go to the MDO lab, they, they have instructions on how to install everything, which is which is awesome. But it, you know, there's a lot of complexity behind MPI and and all the different packages. So uh, appreciate you making that tutorial available because um, it it really does Rescale platform makes it pretty plug and play to get going with these types of optimization uh, tutorials and things. Yep. Thank you. Next question is from Roel, and this one came in around 128, so I'm not sure if that's at the end of Keem's presentation or the beginning of Eric's, uh, but the question is, this MDO example focuses on aerodynamics and structures, but real aircraft design involves many more disciplines. How do you integrate tools that don't expose a gradient, parentheses, costing software examples, or et cetera, or have inputs that are not differenti differentiable, like gauge thickness or material choice? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's a tough one, right? Because I said, my, I claim that there's no, um, well, gradient-based optimization is the only hope to handle a large number of variables. Um, but if, um, you know, if you want to include something that doesn't have gradients or efficient gradients or it's not differentiable, it's just going to cost you and you just have to reduce the number of variables and as, use another type of optimizer uh, that is gradient-free. But unfortunately, there's no way to do all this um, without gradients. So having said that, things like cost, for example, um, that can be differentiable. We found out that a lot of things that people usually think as non-differentiable, you can actually differentiate. Um, and when not continuous, you can smooth them out. So there are tricks to handle this. And in my opinion, worth it, because once you have the gradient, you can do these large scale uh, optimizations. So you know, with respect to wing design, one of the things that I would say, okay, it's definitely not differentiable is, for example, number of ribs. Um, in our optimizations, the span changes, but the number of ribs doesn't change. Um, one hack on that is to change the number of ribs manually and then re-optimize. And, you know, you can do plus minus a couple of ribs. But if you have a lot of discrete variables, uh, a lot of discontinuous variables, um, there's really no good way at the moment to, to do that. Thank you, Keem. I know we're a couple minutes over. We just have a couple more questions here. Harris has a follow-up. The optimization is performed at one flight conditions or multiple. If we have an optimized configuration at Mach 0.75, will this be an optimized one at Mach 0.8? I'm sorry if I'm saying this all wrong. I'm yeah, not that, from your perfect. world. Yeah. <laughs> your comments, yeah. please, he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the answer is no, right? You optimize for the 0.735 that I optimized there. It's not going to be the optimum for 0.85. Uh, that was a single point optimization. The aerodynamic uh, optimizations of the wing were also single point, but we have done multi-point that I didn't show. Uh, and the aerostructure optimization was multi-point. So if you go back and read our work, um, you see we've done a lot of multi-point optimizations. So what happens then is that you don't have quite, quite the perfect pressure distribution anymore. And you don't have the total absence of shock waves. And so you're gonna have some small shock waves at different flight conditions, but you get the best trade between the different flight conditions, right? So it's all optimal, whether it's single point or multi-point depends on what you ask for. So we can do both. 
Great. Another one just popped in here from Arpita. Uh, I think this is for you, Keem. Reduce, reduced order surrogate models have been pursued over the past decades to reduce the computational burden of full physics simulations and optimization problems. Yeah. With the shortcoming of reduced accuracy, does the nearly limitless compute now offered by cloud providers make large scale MDO analysis with full physics representations practical? Or are these reduced order approaches still an important part of MDO research going forward? Okay, so uh, yes, reduced order model surrogates are important and uh, will still be. Um, the airfoil uh, optimization on the webfoil that I showed. The original version was actually a surrogate model, a screening surrogate model that uses gradients. Um, we now use machine learning. Machine learning is a type of surrogate model in, in my mind. Um, reduced order model can also be used for that. Now, the problem with those is that uh, the curse of dimensionality, they still don't scale well with the number of design variables, just like gradient free methods, as I showed there. Uh, so for doing analysis, uh, it's fine. But once you put in optimization, now you need all your design variables to be input. So you need to train whatever surrogates uh, with respect to variations in all the inputs. If you have hundreds, um, right now there's no surrogate that can handle that efficiently. Even with a lot of computer power, uh, there's just some uh, issues there that just, just scale horrendously. Uh, we've done some work towards that, um, and that enabled us to do that um, web foil optimization with surrogates uh, up to 20 variables uh, quite accurately. We have a new machine learning model that um, also about 20 variables input with a accuracy overall about 1%, which is great. Uh, but if you talk about 100, 1,000 variables, you're just going to either spend an insurmountable amount of time training. You might as well do the optimizations that I showed and go explore the design space point by point and take a more direct path to the optimum instead of training these, these models. Great, well, I know we're a few minutes over, so I guess we can end it there, but really appreciate your time, Eric and Keem, and for the presentations that you gave, super interesting stuff. Um, for anyone who would like more information on this, you can obviously visit our Rescale social channels where we will have also some other recordings of past webinars and you could reach out to us if you'd like to also see a copy of this webinar recording uh, and yeah with that if you don't have any final words from either one of you everybody out there stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day all right thank you yeah, thank you take care